I've been conveying it to the to the public and to each other. Um, again, we, we thank you very much. Thank you, General. Train, just a school teacher that's been displaced by the war, just living in the field. Because one lives in the field, one doesn't like to have to look like, you know. We brought some of our home with us. One of the things that is valuable is our carpet, and that, that, that went with us. And who knows what's going to be left after the armies pass through. Could, I, could you explain a few of the items which you have brought from your home? Well, we have the we have the carpet. We have a floor cloth that used to be in one of the rooms that uh, keep the dust down. Uh, I do have some folding beds, and uh, I had served in the army in Mexico, and that's my that's my chest from the old war, as they say. What brings you out here? Do you do this often? Yeah, we well not as much as we used to. We were we're on vacation and. Last year we went to Biltmore, and so we decided to come to Gettysburg this year. It's kind of a Sharon and I got engaged up here, so we kind of a magical mystery tour coming back up here. What do you hope uh, will happen in the future? The future of 2000, the future of 1860. <laughs> what do you hope will happen in the future, sir? Hopefully the Union will be preserved. I'm a, I, I'm a northerner by birth. I have lived a lot of my life in the South, and I think it's just a period of madness, but I think that the Union will be preserved, and I think that the, the black man will be freed, and I think that's important. And which unit you're with? My name is Michael Krause. I'm with the 116th Pennsylvania, which is the Irish Brigade. How long have you been reenacting? I started reenacting when I was 12 years old. That was in 1966. So this is uh, the year 2000. That's 34 years. Could you speak a little bit about the evolution, the changes reenacting has gone through? When I started, it was uh, two years after the centennial, the centennial of the Civil War. Uh, kind of brought reenacting out uh, as a hobby, as a family hobby. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and. Um, uh, it, it made people aware of it, but it was more of a carnival atmosphere where people came, pulled their cars in uh, close to their camps, pitched modern camps, had Coleman stoves, put uniforms on that were just more or less costumes like uh, gray work shirts, gray trousers, yellow stripes, um, blue jack, blue work shirts, big high boots, ladies' purses, things like that. Um, How's it changed? In the late 60s, it started to, uh, or in the late, early 70s, late 60s, there started to be an authentic movement where people started to like say, well, the soldiers didn't really look like this. So they started to focus in on what soldiers looked like. First of all, it was very small in those days, too, in the 66, 67. There, there were 100 or 200 people was considered a large, large event. And uh, some of us belonged to a group called Sherman's Bummers, even as early as those days. We were young and uh, we wore all original clothes. We wore original Civil War jacket, original Civil War hat, original cartridge box, original musket, uh, original pair of boots. Um, many of the items in our haversacks were all original. And we would get together and we were kind of like the bad kids, but we were very into history. And we, we kind of started a movement to get uh, more authenticity in those days. And we watched the hobby grow slowly. And, and in those days, there weren't companies that made things. Guys like a guy would make jackets or a guy would make shoes or a cartridge box he'd bring a trunk full of them pull up you would buy one or you'd buy an original you'd have several original examples uh, and, and that's how you got your uniforms it's evolved today by there are these huge companies that do it there are regiments there are battalions uh, it's gotten quite big and, and the slant has moved luckily to uh, translating it historically much more historically and, trying to see what an individual soldier was like, what a company was like, what a battalion was like, what a battle was like, correctly trying to portray it. It still has, it still has some room to go. Uh, there's a lot of things that, uh, a lot of movements afoot to keep it really authentic. Uh, 
Um, those are good movements. Um, it's a uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's taken several venues. It's gone family. It's gone uh, hardcore authentic. It's gone. Uh, Big command, small command, just very interesting to watch it evolve over the years. You say it's going to change. Which direction do you see it going in and how? Well, events are becoming stagnant. The big large events of the 135th, the 125th, seem to be over. I mean, those big events had as many as 12,000 reenactors. Um, at Gettysburg, I was in command at Gettysburg, the Federal Army here in 88, and uh, we had uh, 5,000 Federals and 7,000 Confederates, and that was a giant event. People from all over the country came. And you look today, you know, here we are at Gettysburg, the weather's perfect, and there may be uh, 1,200 to 2,000 participants here. So I think people are kind of stagnating on the big event uh, scenario, and they're breaking into smaller clusters and doing smaller living history um, type or local events. In fact, if you look in the the events pages of the newspapers, the Civil War papers, you'll see and actually events are two for every weekend of the year. So there's a huge choice and it's fragmenting where people can go. So for the future, I, I see maybe uh, anniversary events like the 150th or 145th years as being big, but for now they're going to be these small, uh, actually tourist oriented events where they're better for the public than they are, really are for us. As a reenactor, how would you like to see the events evolve in the future? Well, I like I like this as a I like it evolving the way it's going with with the the battalion movements, uh, trying to understand the soldier not only as an individual but his his experience in battle as far as um, as his place in the company, the company's place in a regiment, the regiment's pla place in a brigade and how that all evolves. I mean, we're all students of the Civil War, and th this is what we want to see. It doesn't matter if the guy three battalions down from me doesn't have perfect buttonholes. If, if I'm looking down and he's 200 yards away and he's in blue, and there's 400 of them, and they're moving in, in organized and in period movements, then for me as a historian and a student, it, it's, it works. And that's how I'd like to see that keep going to understand the movements, to, to see people be better drilled and perform as regiments and study regiments and study the war. That, that's what I'd like to see happening. Do you have any interesting tidbits of history about the Battle of Gettysburg? Interesting tidbits that about you'd the like to Gettysburg. share? Anything that you've recently learned or studied? A person that you've read about? Um, I own an interesting photograph. I've one of the interests I have is uh, as a collector. I've been a collector of Civil War artifacts since I was a kid. And one of the first photographs I bought was a carte de visite photograph. They're a paper card about two inches by three and a half inches uh, high. They were taken uh, in a studio and uh, they were sold to the soldier. They were contact prints made on paper. Sold to the studio, to the soldier in dozens. You know, a dozen, soldier would buy a dozen. And he would oftentimes autograph them, sometimes with his regiment, and, and exchange them with friends. And actually the first Civil War photograph I ever bought was just a bust portrait of a, of a soldier from his chest up, wearing a hat much like the one I'm wearing, a slouch hat. And on the bottom it said Alpheus Hodges, and on the back it said A.H. Hodges, um, I forget what company, but it was 9th New York Cavalry. And in those days the research material was very sparse. Now it's much with computers and everything. It's much easier to research a particular soldier. In those days it wasn't. And I ended up selling them. Uh, I bought them for 10 cents. I sold them to a friend of mine um, for $10. He for informed me, he, he did some research, and informed me that Hodges fired the first shot at Gettysburg. He was in the 9th New York Cavalry. He was on picket duty with Buford's Cavalry and actually was fired at and returned fire at Marsh Creek. And it was an unknown portrait to him. So that was my first find. I ended up rebuying that from my friend for approximately five hundred dollars. <laughs> now it's worth maybe four or five times more than that, just in the in the rise of interest of Gettysburg related relics in, in history. So I still own that photograph today. In your thirty four years of reenacting. Is there a memorable event? Um the 125th Gettysburg was great. The 125th Antietam, let me back up. The 125th Gettysburg was great, but the 125th Antietam was even better. 
that was the event, the pinnacle event. And it was actually, it was kind of a mistake. The hobby was growing, but it really didn't know, it wasn't familiar with itself, and it didn't really, there were, there were, uh, personality differences among the commands and certain people were boycotting events and uh, it, it turned out to be an excellent site in Boonesboro, Maryland. They had a stone bridge much like Burnside's bridge. The same builder built this bridge and they had, they had uh, stopped traffic. They covered the roads with dirt. They had this beautiful bridge over Antietam Creek. Uh, charging across it was just unbelievable. We, you know, as you can imagine, all got tangled up in the middle because the Federals tried to cross and the Confederates were firing down. The noise was just incredible. I had my head buried and I was pushing behind the color bearer. He's a big guy in our regiment. Just pushing behind him, looking down, and all I could see in the deck of the bridge was was guys laying there and blood all over the bridge. There's blood. I don't know if it's fake or real, but it was all over the bridge. And it was just like the hair on the back of your neck standing up. And we finally broke through and got out. And you know, you turn around and look back and saw the catastrophe on the bridge, and people laying all over it, and the smoke, and it, it was unbelievable. That was an unbelievable scene. As well as the next day in the cornfield, at dawn, we had the artillery open up in the cornfield, and and there were maybe I don't know, four thousand guys, three, four thousand guys combined. It just was, it was unbelievable. It was really, really unbelievable. That was a pinnacle event. It sounds like you occasionally get caught up and forget where you are. We call that magic moments, and that's what you live for. Even if they're brief seconds, every once in a while you hit a magic moment, and it's uh, just that's what it's all about. Where time doesn't exist and you're there, you know, and you you're actually scared or pumped up and elated, or you're you're running on pure adrenaline. Things are happening around you, and and you know when you read about battle and you read about Civil War battle and the confusion, the noise, the the volume, uh, it, it's exactly what it was like. I mean, luckily, people aren't really being killed here, but the intensity is such that, that you really do feel that. Who are we? There he is! Come on! Come on! 
Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. My name is Captain Simpson. I happen to be one of the few women to hold the rank in the Confederate Military Medical Corps. It was granted by Lee himself for the work that we've done. What you've come to is a medical living history demonstration. And the area that you're looking at right now is our surgical area where we would bring a patient from the field put them on the table and basic things that we did here in this hospital is amputations and as you can see as we amputated we would just throw the limbs onto a pile and as they piled up we would have orderlies that would come by and take them away and dispose of them for us. Um, one of the things that was discovered just prior to the Civil War was chloroform and this was discovered about five years before the war started and it was an anesthesia and it would allow the surgeon to put the patient to sleep and give him a window of time and opportunity that he could actually work on the soldier. There's two methods to deliver this and this is a funnel type method and what they would do is they would put the chloroform right in here which holds this wad of cotton. The other end of the funnel is where it would absorb and they would hold it over the patient's nose and mouth and he would go to sleep. The other method is this little device, and this is called a Chisholm inhaler. And this was invented by Dr. Chisholm, and it actually has a wick right in here. The chloroform would be put in here, and then you would actually put it in the nostrils, and the patient would go to sleep. Okay? The one thing that they could do, uh, particularly that, that they, they have records of, are your amputations. And a good surgeon could amputate a leg in about a minute and a half. A good surgeon could do that. What you have here are three types of devices to remove uh, bullets. This is just a, a forceps type device. This is a bullet remover plus a tenaculum that would actually allow you to get the muscle tissue so you could tie off any bleeders. And this is a little amputation saw. They kept explicit records and if you were here looking for a loved one or something, you'd be able to go through our book and find out everything you needed to find. Uh, one of the medications that they actually gave the soldier back then was whiskey. And they would give them an ounce of whiskey every 15 minutes. Well, the local area, being that we're the medical corps and we are nurses, the soldier would know that the whiskey barrel was kept in the hospital tent. So the matron, who is the head nurse for that particular day, would carry with her the key to the whiskey barrel. Not the surgeon, because the surgeons tend to like to nip at the whiskey. And we had to keep explicit records which would tell who we were giving our medications to and how much they would, would uh, uh, use. And there's a story in the Southern Women's uh, book about two young men who decided in the middle of the night that they were going to come steal the whiskey barrel. So being that, you know, there's not much young ladies can do, the one thing that the nurse also kept in her pocket is her little derringer. And there's a story of this young man, these two young men coming and her pointing the gun and being that they weren't sure of the aim, decided they were not going to keep, you know, trying to take the whiskey barrel. This particular gun has a very interesting feature in the fact that it is a Philadelphia Derringer. If you want to take a close look at it or see the design of it, how big and heavy it is, this is the, the gun, or the replica of the gun that John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln with. And you can pretty much see, you know, the damage that this would do. Uh, one of the things, this is a southern military uh, uh, hospital, and unfortunately as the war progressed and the blockade became so stringent, you couldn't get a lot of the supplies in uh, because of the blockade, and they would take horse hair, go over to the cavalry camp and tell them they needed some manes and tails pulled, uh, ladies' dresses that the people would donate, they'd, they'd tear them apart, they'd take all those nice silk sutures, and they would boil them to make them more pliable so you could actually use it for suturing material. And then, uh, if, if you look at your records, you'll notice that the southern, the south's infection rate sort of stayed like down here, where the north still kind of, of went up. And they didn't realize the time by boiling all these materials, they were actually sterilizing it. You know, they were making, you know, making these materials sterile. Um, if you want to come in this way, I'll show you. But they went back to a lot of your homeopathic remedies. All right, and they would have alfalfa which they would use for a soothing tea. 
which was which was very good. They would have chamomile, which they would would crush up into a powder and and into a tea, and that was is for pain. That's another good one that they would have. Cayenne. This is actually cayenne pepper, and they would use this on wounds for cauterizations. And if you think about it, when you taste cayenne, that's pretty pretty potent stuff. Um, they would have uh, cherry bark, white willow, and dogwood. They found by combining those three, because they couldn't get quinine, this made an excellent substitute for quinine, which was, was for your fevers, like typhoid fever, those kind of things. The one that is really good is um, they would make a tea out of this, out of this lavender, okay? Nice soothing, soothing tea out of lavender. Uh, and the other one, they would make a polis out of this one, and that is um, that is this one. It is um, <laughs> it escapes me at the moment. Isn't that horrible? But it's it smells like maple syrup. Mm -hmm. Slippery elm. I knew I'd get it. <laughs> Slippery elm. And they would make a polis of that, and that's what they would put down for swelling or anything. This little thing. This is, anybody have any clue what this is? This is called a mad, <laughs> this is called a mad stone, okay? This is a stone out of a cow's gallbladder. This has been washed up, it's been dipped in milk to get all that material off of it, and they would actually put it over like a wound or something, and it would like cauterize the wound, and it worked, it really worked. And the reason it works so well is this has a property of salt and it would actually cauterize the wound. And these were like priceless. One this size was just unbelievable. So, you know, you would make your teas and, and like I said, you go back to a lot of the homeopathic remedies. And there were no pharmacies, so the physician would actually have his, his own little pharmacy set up. He would grind his medicines in the, in the mortar and pistol. He would roll them into pill forms, you know, keep, you know, keep the different pills on hand. Uh, he'd have lavender for stomach aches, he'd have castor oil, we all know what that one's for, uh, tinctures, he'd have your opiums that he would grind up, you know, and, and give to, you know, and of course your, your alcohol, your rubbing alcohols um, would, would also uh, be used to help cool the patient down if they were feverish. So they were their own uh, pharmaceutical company. And then of course back here, like I said, they, they, the major thing that they did would be amputations, and this is a uh, amputation kit, and it would they would they would have their bone saw, consequently saw bones, is is the title that they would have, and they would take an amputation knife, and basically what they would do in a matter of like I said a minute to a minute and a half is they'd make an actual slit that would go through the arm like this, they'd bring it completely around like that until it met the other side, they would then retract the tissue with some type of a hook and then they take the saw and they saw through the arm or the leg in a matter of, of like I said just minutes they would take some of those things that we were talking about out there they'd pack the wound with lint wrap it up in a bandage and that would be the end of that the uh, other good thing which is which is people are always interested in seeing this little instrument is called a tree fine now you wouldn't find it in a field hospital so much as you would back on a line hospital or in a hospital in the city where they actually could deep compress your skull if you would have some type of a, of a head injury that gave you a hematoma and they would actually let this blood clot come out you know and therefore the other interesting one is this this is called a fleam this little device is called a fleam and these edges are extremely sharp and what they would do is they'd find a vessel in your arm and they would nick it like four times and then they put you over a bleeding bowl because they figured by the bad, bad blood coming out and the good blood coming in they were getting rid of any infection well what they didn't realize is all they were doing was making your patient weaker because you know you're losing blood and they couldn't afford to lose any more leeches they used leeches they used magnets um, to help with all this they were dentists, you know, they would pull teeth, you know, they'd come in. Most of them started out as dentists. Most of your surgeons actually were barbers and dentists. They would come through and, and pull a tooth. The other um, th thing is, if you're all familiar, this, this is what makes it so unbelievable. If you've seen the type of injury that a person would come through, 
there was no reconstructing. They had to do amputations. You know, you're looking at a bullet that looks like this, which is a normal, normal type bullet. And then you have, this is what they're taking out. Now, you can imagine the kind of damage this is going to do, ripping through your, your uniform, through the tissue, through the bone, and it just shatters everything. I mean, there was just no saving anything whatsoever. The patients would come in, um, you know, they would be on cots if they were lucky, they'd be laying out on pallets, under trees, the flies, the heat, everything would be terrible. You'd give them teas in the feeding cup, you would actually, you know, the nurses would shave the patient. Um, you, you, know, you do all your documentation with your de at your desk and keeping all the all the information. Um, and depending on how well everything was going, that was fine. But every once in a while, you got a patient that came in, and the nurses would have to go find the unit commander to come because there was something wrong with Corporal Cashman. Now Arthur Cashman is a gentleman from New York who, uh, until 1902 went through the Civil War, no problem, was involved in a car accident. Well, Corporal Cashman happens to be female, okay? But she served in the Civil War as a male impersonator the whole way through, with distinction. Okay, they have documentation of about 450 women who actually fought in the Civil War. Um, and they, some of them were known, some of them fought right beside their husbands, they were camp favorites, you know, they helped with the laundry or whatever, and if a compatriot filed, they picked up the, the flag and went right out in the field. The ladies' aid societies uh, were instrumental in supplying the hospital, field hospital with things. They would get to the towns and they'd send out jams and breads and fresh fruits and, and jellies and, and meats, anything they needed. The South had a lot of individual type units like that. The North had the U.S. Sanitation Commission, who was run by Dorothea Dix, and she had three things for her nurses. And the three things were they had to be over the age of 30, they had to be a widow, or they had to be very plain or as ugly as sin. Those were her three <laughs> criteria. Being that if they were a widow, they weren't going to swoon at the sight of a male body, you know, or the things that they had to take care of. If they were over the age of 30, they were probably not looking to get married, and they were considered a spinster, so therefore, you know, they were going to be very well suited for her work. And plain and ugly is that, you know, the soldier, not that he's going to recuperate any faster, but if you have a nice young 18-year-old holding your hand, something's going to hurt just a little longer. <laughs> you know, I'm going to stay here in this hospital tent just a smidge longer than what, you know, what needs to be. So those were her criteria for her nurses, which, you know, into the war in a matter of months went strictly out the window because they realized that the need for nurses was so overwhelming. And they found that they could do wonderful things. They were great at organization things. They were great at tearing a camp down and getting it on the move in a matter of hours. They were good at soliciting areas for the, the food supplies that they needed. The ladies aid societies got all the things together. You know, Clara Bart and um, Myra Eck Beck Breckenridge were all women of such distinction and you know we have people that come through and say how can you reenact war and that's not what this is really all about. This is about the ordinary person that did such extraordinary things in a time that was just unbelievable. It's things that had never happened on the soil before and that was brother fighting brother and a medical corps that up to that point really did not exist. So...
General William Nelson Pendleton, and he was on General Lee's staff, and he was here at Gettysburg. Uh, General Pendleton was chief of artillery, and he was a great organizer uh, here at Gettysburg. Also, <coughs> excuse me, many other battles. He was in every major battle from first Manassas to the, the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in April of 1865. Uh, do you have any questions you want to ask yes, me? Yes, sir. Could you speak a bit about the role that he played here at Gettysburg, um, and if the role differs between day one, two, and three? They're portraying different battles here uh, today, tomorrow, and Monday. Uh, General Pendleton was on, in the he he was commander of the uh, vet of the uh, artillery reserve, which he had five battalions in reserve here at Gettysburg. Uh, of course, General, or excuse me, Colonel uh, Potter Alexander was Chief of Artillery, uh, First Corps. That was in Longstreet's Corps, and he worked close with uh, the other, the other three, the other three uh, colonels who were in in the uh, three corps. There was Colonel uh, uh, Alexander, Colonel Pelham, and uh, Walker, and they were, of course. Uh, General Pendleton was over command over all of them, so he worked closely with the three chiefs of artillery of the other three corps. Could you um, do you ever do first uh, person impressionations uh, from living history, uh, the impersonation as if it were today, the battle today? Uh, not really. We do a lot of it in the schools and so on and so forth mm -hmm. with, the, with the with the children. Uh, Oh. Pendleton, Pendleton graduated with General Lee, uh, Jefferson Davis, who was chief of artillery, or, uh, uh, president of the Confederacy. Uh, he j graduated in the class of 1830 with, the, with these fellows. That was an important uh, uh, class of 1830 here at West, po West Point in New York. Uh, Pendleton, General Lee, Robert E. Lee, uh, Jefferson Davis, Bledsoe, Magruder, these were all generals during the Civil, during the Civil War. Do you know a little bit about his background? Um, what, he, what role he played during the battles? Well, he was the, he was the overseer of all the, of all the artillery. In fact, he, he goofed up a little bit on one, one occasion. Uh, on the third day's battle, a picket's charge, uh, Colonel Alexander, who placed the guns out on the field before the charge started, uh, Colonel Alexander, he wanted nine howitzers, which are the small cannons, to go across the field in front of the art uh, in front of the infantry. But somehow, through poor communications, uh, Pendleton had moved four of those of those uh, howitzers back behind A.P. Hill's Corps so they weren't in the line of fire. Some other officer moved the other five to a different area so they weren't in the, in the, in the line of fire from the Union Artillery on Cemetery Ridge. So it was kind of goof up on, uh, on, on all parts. But that's what happened during, actually during the three days battle of Gettysburg, they had poor communications among the generals which Lee made a remark, he said, if I had generals that could follow orders, <laughs> so that, but none of these generals were perfect. They every, all, all through the line, they, some of them made mistakes, or we, we all made mistakes, because none of us are perfect. At, at the time of, uh, just before the, the Battle of Manassas, uh, uh, Pendleton was a colonel at the time. And he marched to uh, Manassas with Colonel Thomas Jeff or Thomas uh, Jackson. When they arrived at uh, at First Manassas Battle, of course the Confederates were driven way back uh, by the Union Army under the command of McClellan. Uh, Pendleton, being a religious man, he had four cannon, 
or four guns. And being religious, every, every canon had a name. So he named his four Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And before he gave them orders to fire, he looked across the field to the Union Army, he looked up at heaven, he says, Dear Lord, have mercy on their souls. Then he gave them orders to open fire. After the battle, or during the battle, uh, Colonel Pendleton had his ear grazed by a mini ball, he had his back grazed by a mini ball, and his horse was shot out from underneath him. This is one of the stories, that, uh, a true story that happened to Pendleton. And when afterwards he says, well, the dear Lord was on my side this time. So, and he never lived that down. He, he, that went through the whole, the whole four years of the, of the war where he's made that statement, dear Lord, have mercy on their souls. So that's one of the stories of uh, Colonel Pendleton. Thank you, sir. At first I thought you were General Lee, and now I come to find out there was a resemblance. Could you speak there about was, that? They, they were two years difference in age. Uh, General Lee was born in 1807. General Pendleton was born in 1809. And they both had gray beards. There was only two years difference in age, and they were always together or near one another. And at a distance, somebody, one of the soldiers would yell, Oh, here comes General Pendleton. It might have been General Lee or it might have been General Pendleton because they looked so much alike that they, they, they couldn't tell which one was which until they got closer. But that's another one of the stories that come out of the Civil War, which is true. True about the, both generals. And in 1870, uh, William Nelson Pendleton gave the eulogy at General Lee's funeral at Lexington, Virginia in 1870. So they were lifelong friends. Lifelong friends, yeah. Lifelong friends. Graduated from uh, West Point Academy together, and uh, after the war, they both wound up in Lexington, Virginia. And they were both, General Lee, or Robert E. Lee, was a member of, uh, of Pendleton's church, the Grace Church at uh, Lexington, Virginia. So they were sidekicks all the way through. It was Pendleton that... Uh, told uh, or wrote a letter to Lee to get him to accept the position as president of the of Washington uh, College at Lexington, Virginia. And uh, Robert E. Lee took him up on it and rode over 100 miles to get there and accepted the post as uh, president of the Lexington College. Then they were back together again until Lee died five years later after the war. Thank you. any foreign objects and barrels are not clogged, damaged, to make sure that for safety reasons. Safety is very important.
Jimmy, look at your left. Oh, 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 oh,
The purpose of the skirmishers is to disrupt the enemy's formation as it approaches us. They try to pick off the officers, the sergeants. Um, if they haven't shot at any the cannoneers, they try to pick off those guys. Or more importantly, the cannon horses, because if the horses are, are down, they can't drag the guns away. Um, and that's about it. Down. <laughs> Also, if you are not yet engaged with the enemy, the skirmishers go out in advance and, and keep moving forward until they make contact with the enemy skirmishers. Then you know where the enemy is and you can start formulating your plan from there. But you have to find them first. We can see them here, but uh, normally battles are fought at distances of 300 yards, 400 yards, until it comes time for the all-out bloody bayonet charge and things like that. So shoot them high again, boys. I should hope so. At this point, we do a little brave part. I think I'd be backing down in the swale. Yeah. Brave part. Just bend over. Thank you, sir. Howdy, man. Sir, I'm sorry. Come on, boys. Thunder cap box. Thunder cap box. Get your interval. Fire, fire, brigade! Fire, fire, brigade! Fire, fire, brigade! Ready! Ready! Right 
got you.
Seventh in glory. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ken Courtney. I'm with Living History Music, and uh, this is uh, Dale Harrison, also known as uh, General George Armstrong Custer, also known as a major pain in the neck sometimes, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, five, four, three, two. My name is Dale Harrison. I'm an eleventh grade history teacher at Nazareth High School in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, but in my alter ego. I'm Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer. Of course, everybody realizes General Custer was here at Gettysburg. He was at both Hanover and he was at East Cavalry Field. The most important thing about being at Gettysburg was that Jeb Stuart was known as the Invincibles prior to his meeting with General Custer. And after that, they were not as invincible. Could you speak a bit about uh what duties you had during these three days of battle? Well, prior to the Battle of Gettysburg, several days prior, I received my Brigadier Stars. And uh, Hanover was the first action in which I actually led a brigade. Uh, we were very successful in that encounter. We were also very successful at East Cavalry Field in keeping Jeb Stuart from coming up behind the Union lines. So uh, it was the beginning of a long and illustrious career. Talk to me some more, General Custer, please. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about the war. Well, we're going to go down and uh, we're going to take care of the Shenandoah Valley. Not going to be very pleasurable burning all those barns and all those crops, but it's just something that we're going to have to do. General Sheridan has a, has a plan, and we're going to absolutely burn out the granary of the Confederacy. We will make them howl. Could you speak a little bit about uh, your thoughts and feelings about the Indians? Well, that's a little bit into the future, but uh, <clears throat> again, at that time, being a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army, you follow orders. Not that I didn't like Indians, I respected Indians, I respected their way of life, but uh, they stood in the way of manifest destiny, they stood in the way of progress, and consequently, orders were that we were to round them up and put them on reservations. They didn't go willingly, and consequently, that would be one of the worst days of my life. Actually, it would be the last day of my life. <laughs> Could you come into the next millennium for a minute, sir? And, I certainly can. And speak in the present day, uh, July 2nd, 2000, about what you think reenacting is about. Oh, you know, being a history teacher, it's like real close to me. And uh, I, I, I'm a living anachronism. I, I, I feel like a person is born out of place in time. And it always seems like the past was much more interesting and much more active than the present. I really don't like particularly living in the year 2000. I think the year 1863 or the year 1876 would have been much more interesting. Yes. Do you sleep on the battlefield here, sir? Uh, sometimes I do. At the present time, I'm having a little bit of a problem with my back, so uh, consequently I uh, opted for a bed this time. Well, when you're here, if you've participated in uh, being here after hours, um, have you noticed any activity going on in the fields? Uh, yes, I've noticed a lot of activities going on. A lot of it has to do with, uh, <clears throat> shall we say, uh, frivolous pursuits among the troops. <laughs> Being a good person cannot save. It is only by repenting of your sins and trusting as best you can in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins that God will save your soul. And I ask you this morning, have you done it? Can we stand, please, with every head bowed and every eye closed? Nobody looking around. Please, nobody rustling.
saw this saw where you can use that it'll get down and it'll burn and stuff actually. I mean, it won't hurt the barrel either. Try that. It's expensive. It's expensive, but it takes care of it. I don't mean. <laughs> well, the one guy's talking to him, this other guy's measuring him and all this shit. Yeah. And they even paid for two mourners. And, you know. Hey. Hello. I had to pay some way. I need to get a. Makes right, let him close. Oh. No, you don't want to stop him. Ah, I mean, you ain't kosher, I'll look at it. <laughs> Dixie over speakers on the helicopter, right? Yeah. Like Robert the Ball. Charlie don't surf. The blood's off. Like a vodka. Hello. Yeah, the guy, all right. Let's do it too. Hey, what's the difference? First company. Right shoulder. Shift. We built the same things we did yesterday. We had a couple bad days last month. I told him, just stay like this. I'm going to find a boat work in Alaska. Yeah, some order in the whole Yeah, okay. Are you going to do it? How many are you going to get? Probably three. Company, shoulder, first company, shoulder, on. Support, on. Support, Thank you. 
Rest. Facing on the camera. Soldiers of the 1860s believed that heat left your body through the biggest source, which would be your stomach. So therefore, they would keep their top button buttoned, unbutton the rest of their blouse, keep their hat on, even though we know today that, that keeps the heat in your body and makes it worse. Could you tell me a little more about what's happening today? Well, from my understanding, there's some Yankee troops up ahead, a place crossroads called Gettysburg. We just come up. Got about a six mile march. We got here about an hour ago, starting to form up, waiting to be sent in. We don't know what's ahead of us yet. We don't know if it's the entire damn Yankee army or just damn part of it. But we're going to go forward and we're going to drive them. We're going to drive them. We've always driven. We've never done nothing less under Marsh Robert. And today, maybe victory will be ours again. Who are you with, sir? We are the 7th Tennessee Company A Hog Drivers. 1st Battalion, ANV, Army of Northern Virginia. Could you just tell me um, what unit you're with and your name and... Uh, My name is Rick Eisenhart. I'm with 1st Texas Company E. Uh, sometimes when you go out on a battlefield like this, you actually feel the fears that these guys actually went through. There's times where you're like what we call in the bubble and you're out there and just for that moment in time, just for that moment in your life of reenacting, you actually feel that you're actually there. You might be firing a volley or, or, or a volley being fired at you, and it's so amazing. You just, you 
you're just transported back to that time, just for that second, and you can actually feel the fears that the guys went through. It's uh, it's hard to explain to a person who's never been out here, but this is like playing a modern sport. You have to be in shape. Colonel Miller. You have to deal with the elements that they de dealt with. Uh, the heat is unbearable at times. We've seen men drop from just heat. Um, this is this is like almost being doing the real thing, except actually killing each other. And I pray to God we never have to do that ever again. But this is this is what it's all about. You know, this is this is great. This is this is living the history. You can read all the books. You can see all the tapes, all the movies, but if uh, you really want to know what it's like, this is where you'd have to go. And get into a really good unit, because you'll find out what it was like as close as possible. Probably for a nice pack. I wonder if somebody went down already. Well, we're about to go into the second day of battle, and it's it was brutal yesterday. A lot of bloodshed, a lot of injured main troopers out there. We're going to try to drive them back today, hopefully. Maybe finish with a bayonet charge, whatever we can do, but we got to push them back. It's Our food's getting low. Hopefully we can capture some of the Union supplies. Their food or medical supplies, is, it's getting bad. It, the Union blockade, it's, it's hurting us. It's hurting us bad. We've got to do something. We've got to push them out of there to get their supplies. It's, that's how bad it is. Could you tell me your name, sir, and who you're with? Private Pete Verroca from the 26 North Carolina Company G from the Rochester, New York area.
six company. Hey, hey, there'll be plenty of room later, boys. You just say it. Actually, Lieutenant. Come on now, boys.
Dan to watch his right play. Tell Dan to watch his right play. Dan, hit it down. Get him off towards the center.
so much already on the battle that it's... Is Kale changed hands six times? What? Yeah. Can you feel changed hands six times? Uh, it was pretty bloody. Uh, I, I really don't know the specifics on it. Well, how do you feel about reenacting it? Reenacting it? Oh, it's an honor to uh, remember what, what happened here and what happened uh, with... Medic! Woo! My leg! Um,
Okay, five, four, three, two. My name is Nick Seropoulos. I'm the Ordnance Officer for Longstreet's Corps. And today's right battle is dedicated to General Hillsman, and we wish him a speedy recovery from his uh, illness. <laughs> Back up, boys. Stay out of the circle. Yeah, but it's already had those. That's the happy land. You Very good. Let them know, boys. Listen up. 
This is for Chuck Hillsman, boys. Loud and clear. Loud and clear, wow. gentlemen. Three cheers for General Hillsman! Three cheers for General, General Hillsman! South Carolina boys. Who are we? South Carolina! Who are we? South Carolina! Who are we? South Carolina! Left hey, oblique! Dream elevation, left oblique! Ah. 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 Dennis! Yes. Break, break! To the rear! Break, break, to the rear! Tell me that. Kind of focus whenever you're ready, sir. Okay. Hi, I'm Bob Rosati, 6th Wisconsin. I'm their hospital steward. Uh, usually I run with Company K to 6th. Uh, it's the second day out here. We had people going down on the way out today. Uh, at least one that we transported off with a parent. And there were others that really showed the signs of it getting out there. Uh, clouded over during the battle, so it made it a little easier. But we still evacuated at least half a dozen. So. Not too bad. Nobody's dead. That counts. 